assalamu alaikum students so this lecture is a continuation of our uh, kidney uh, renal related physiology lectures and today we start part 1 of a very important topic namely glomerular filtration rate in this lecture will be basically our objectives are three uh, we will look at what gfr actually is we'll define it uh, with its uh, normal statistics uh, we'll uh, look at its clinical importance uh, then we'll discuss factors which affect it and uh, at the end of this particular lecture we'll be discussing uh, regulation of gfr uh, estimation of gfr along with the concept of clearance will be done in the second lecture so uh, first we need to see what gfr actually is and why is it important so gfr basically is a is a is a rate it's a mathematical expression of the filtration capability of kidneys and you need to understand uh, the main function of the kidney is to filter blood so that we get rid of uh, uh, the waste products and we reabsorb what is important for the body uh, i've talked i've spoken about the word reabsorb and why don't we uh, mention absorb uh, in my previous lectures this is just to reclaim what uh, basically uh, got filtered out at the glomerulus so this being uh, the most important feature of kidney uh, it's uh, it's a quantitative assessment is uh, of paramount importance so for example uh, a person a has uh, a normal uh, filtration capability of the kidney while person b has uh, a disease of the kidney uh, in which the filtration uh, profile or the ability of the kidneys to filter uh, to filter out blood has decreased okay how do we know how do we report this to uh the patient uh to uh to the other colleagues of ours what is the way to report it this is the way to report it so if we mention that person a's gfr is normal or person b's gfr is decreased or such and such as uh, gfr has increased so this is just to say just to comment on what the kidney is doing in terms of filtration and remember it all starts with filtration ultra filtration uh, so blood comes in, in uh, at the level of glomerulus it gets filtered out the plasma bit uh, we we'll look at what ratios are there involved in a bit uh, and then when when the filtration has occurred and the filtrate has has uh, been formed and it hits the tubular network uh, then all sorts of reabsorptions and secretions and excretions happen but it all starts with filtration if you notice okay so the the kidney's ability to filter uh, blood is that main stay of the whole function of or the most prolific function of the kidney so uh, it's it's uh, of paramount importance that we understand the quantitative uh, expression of this filtration and this this expression is called the GFR glomerular filtration rate uh, since this word is here so you you should predict that some sort of time stamp will be in that definition so all the filtrate that is formed by all uh, healthy or whatever uh, all nephrons basically of whatever status uh, because all nephrons are not the same really so we we say that all nephrons participating in filtration of uh, the kidney uh, per unit time it's conventional to say per minute uh, is called gfr the mean value is 125 ml uh, per minute which basically means 150 liters a day now uh, if if uh, you have this uh, mathematical mind uh, this is an interesting statistic this is a lot of stuff going through the kidney per unit time so in if you can see that uh, we have 5 liters of blood uh out of which about 3ish uh, liter is plasma why i demarcate is is because normally 
the cellular component of the blood is not does not participate in uh, and should not participate in filtration it's the liquid portion that is plasma so you can imagine uh, kidneys working at this rate 180 liters a day it's a uh, it's a serious uh, situation uh, serious uh, work quantitative work this means that the plasma of the entire body gets filtered out 60 times in a day or 20 uh, 24 or 25 times per hour okay uh, and another way to look at it is that uh, if you do not recapture reabsorb most of this filtered stuff in the tubule you'll be running out of plasma within 24 minutes this is another very interesting way of uh, looking at it i uh, a person will collapse uh, within 24 minutes if the tubule doesn't function because of the sheer amount of glomerular filtration okay so for this uh, to happen for for the kidneys to filter at the glomerulus uh, this amount of uh, of uh, filtrate uh, the the filter the kidney the, the glomerulus needs to be supplied uh, by this amount so 1100 ml per minute is the renal blood flow of which plasma is roughly half uh, 600 ml per minute so said in another way if 1100 ml and you you may find that it says 1200 in some books it, it varies so if this amount of blood uh, carrying this amount of plasma enters the glomeruli per minute you will get a gfr of 125 125 ml per minute okay now so this is one this is one aspect which uh, you need to remember and remember that this is a very common question uh, why was of kidney usually start uh, with this question uh, i've i've seen pay, uh, students messing up the values uh, or no, not getting the definitions right or the concept right and this is very very bad usually what happens is they say it's it's a, a rate of one nephron or just nephron and the examiner can ask is it one nephron is it one kidney and then you know the whole confusion starts so basically all nephrons per unit time is gfr and its mean value is around 125 ml per minute it does not mean that everyone has this exact same 125 ml per minute it's a it's an average it it can be 120 it can be 121 22 25 26 maybe but not very wild swings from this value okay another way of looking at it is this term called filtration fraction filtration fraction is uh, 0.2 or it's there's another way of saying 20 percent of renal plasma flow what does it mean we mean to say that 20 percent of plasma which is entering the glomeruli gets filtered out while the rest of the 80 percent uh, is not disturbed this can be uh, viewed clearly in this diagram it's a very good diagram uh, so he has shown that plasma volume that is entering the afferent arteriole is let's say 100 percent so 100 100 units uh, enter the enter the afferent arteriole and go into the glomerulus now we know the ultrastructure of glomerulus is pro filtration right so under high pressure under high hydrostatic pressure we mentioned this one of the distinguishing features of the glomerular bed as compared to the other capillary networks of the body is that this features a higher hydrostatic pressure something which will come in today's lecture in, in, in another aspect as well so under high hydrostatic pressure uh, plasma gets filtered out how much 20 percent as we just said 20 percent this is the filtration fraction so out of say our uh, hypothetical 100 units of plasma if they're entering the glomeruli 20 units will be filtered out into the Bauman uh, uh, space and on to the tubule while the rest of the 80 percent will not be disturbed and it will leave the glomeruli through the efferent arteriole 
and on to the pericapillary network and so on. Okay, so this is one thing. Remember, 20% is the filtration fraction, meaning 20% of plasma gets filtered out. 80%, and this is normal, and 80% basically leaves the efferent arteriole to join the peritoneal network and then eventually systemic circulation. It's given back to the systemic circulation. So at a time, it's the filtration fraction which the kidney works with uh, and this 80% is spared. There's another way of saying it. Now what happens, what, what is the eventual fate of uh, this 20%? This is not the focus of our uh, studies here because we are right now at the level of the glomerulus, but just to complete the sequence, let's, let's just see what happens. So it enters the tubule, the tubular network, uh, the proximal convoluted tubule and so on and so forth. And look at this, more than 19% of fluid out of this 20 is reabsorbed. It's reabsorbed and it's given to the adjacent peritubular network. If you remember the anatomy, the functional anatomy, we spoke about this, that efferent arteriole then goes on to make the peritubular network, which runs closely alongside the renal tubule okay so this is that proximity and this is why it's proximal it's it's uh, i beg your pardon it's uh, it's right next to it uh, it's uh, very close to it because there are there is communication between this network and the tubule which is running side by side in this case reabsorption is taking place okay so reabsorption means from the tubule into the peritubular network okay so uh, out of the 20 percent that we we filtered out the filtration fraction, 19% uh, goes back and only 1% is excreted out in urine. This is to complete the picture. All right, hope this is clear. Okay, so uh, what is the importance of GFR? Uh, as I said, it's the measurement of the most prominent feature of the kidney and which is filtration, okay? Uh, Clinically speaking, it's basically a prognostic marker of, dis of uh, any kidney disease. What is prognosis? Basically, prognosis, you must have heard this word and, and studied it in your first years. Uh, and this is, you, you read it in uh, reference to ESR, that ESR is a prognostic marker. It's not a diagnostic marker. What's the difference between prognosis and diagnosis? Diagnosis is when you can tell uh, when a when a substance or a marker or, or a, a figure, a statistic is diagnostic. We mean that this shows what is exactly wrong with such a such and su such a such system or uh, such and such uh, organ. So we know the cause of disease. Prognosis, however, tells us something is wrong, but doesn't give us the exact picture. So when we say that GFR is is a pro, is a prognosis is a prognostic marker we are saying that when there is fluctuation in gfr so if, if you hear the statement that gfr in such and such patient has decreased or it has increased uh, you can safely say that something is wrong with this patient what is wrong with this patient gfr cannot tell you that okay it can tell you readily that something is wrong uh, which then will should prompt you to further investigate this patient okay so this is what prognosis is and in patients which you admit uh, who are serious and you admit them in your in the hospital uh, gfr serial measurements of gfr will tell you whether your management is working in a beneficial way or it is not affecting the patient so uh, on day one if the gfr has been decreased by 50 percent and by two weeks of therapy of your or, and your clinical management if the gfr has improved uh, by say uh, 25 percent then you you should be confident that whatever you're doing it's 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 working in this patient but if the if after if serial uh, gfr estimations show you that the 50 percent deficit of gfr is still there and it's not fluctuating really towards the better then you need to adjust or if uh, god forbid it shows that now it's 75% loss of GFR. Then you clearly can see that your therapy is not benefiting the patient either because the therapy itself is inappropriate or that the underlying disorder is very uh, quick or very aggressive so that some ma major changes to your uh, 
to your therapy needs to take place. So this is where GFR fits in, in, fits in, in clinical practice. Okay. So I will assume that you know what this, these mean, Starling forces. Okay, so I'll just briefly jog your memory when you did circulation in first year. Uh, they talked about, they must have talked about, and you must have studied uh, the fact, the forces acting across a typical capillary system. Okay, so there are forces which would push the push the fluid out, and there are forces which uh, want to keep the fluid in. So if quickly you can you 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 can you can answer what would hydrostatic pressure of the capillary do is it a pro filtration uh, force or anti filtration force if your answer is it's pro filtration you're right it it tends to force fluid out of the capillary what about plasma colloid osmotic pressure or simply oncotic pressure what does that do Again, if you, your answer is, it's, it keeps the fluid in the capillary. So in that, in that sense, it's one of those forces which uh, goes against filtration. You are correct. These are the two forces which act across uh, all capillary membranes. And hence, uh, glomerular capillary membrane is no exception. In fact, here, the hydrostatic force is, is more than hydrostatic pressure elsewhere. So these are the Starling forces, uh, which basically cause GFR. If you know what I mean, this is this is how uh, filtrate filtrate is is born, quote unquote, is formed. Okay, uh, these Starling forces force fluid out, mainly the hydrostatic pressure, out of that capillary, and hence filtration fraction is formed. Okay, now. How is filtration, uh, how, 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 what affects Starling forces themselves? So once again, Starling forces basically make GFR. They make the filtrate and they in turn get affected by the amount of renal blood flow that is coming in and our, uh, uh, afferent and efferent arteriolar resistance at any given time. So these two factors they affect starling forces and starling forces being the generator of gfr then affect gfr okay this is the sequence of events so when we when you are asked about factors affecting gfr you mention starling forces maybe in brackets you want to say uh, which they which in turn get affected by changes in renal blood flow and resistance of the glomerular efferent and efferent capillary network and number two uh, this quotient glomerular capillary quotient or kf we, we will we will talk about this as well so this slide is the is the main slide when you're talking about factors affecting gfr so now we we we, we get this overview of starling forces across the glomerular membrane as i mentioned look this is a simple schematic it shows the afferent arteriole the glomerulars and the efferent arteriole okay and in the glomerulus, he is showing glomerular hydrostatic pressure, and it's it shows it's it's 60 mmHg, which if you remember is around 30 to 35 in a normal capillary network. So this is clearly uh, significantly higher uh, than your uh, average capillary network. And then he shows uh, oncotic pressure, uh, colloid osmotic pressure. The values are here, um, and then. Uh, outside of this glomerulus, you have the Bauman capsule where he shows pressure. He just says capsule pressure. Basically, this is a hydrostatic pressure. So, uh, first, just focus on these three. Uh, if, and if you remember the discussion of starting forces in circulation, you would remember that uh, there's, there is a fourth one. So, there is hydrostatic pressure and colloid osmotic pressure. Then there's hydrostatic pressure. What about the colloid pressure in the glomerular capsule? It's not mentioned here. We'll, we'll talk about this. So under this pressure, 
this hydrostatic pressure, high pressure, filtrate uh, plasma basically goes out of the glomerulus and comes in the Bauman capsule and uh, that filtration fraction that we talked about that is born, okay, that is formed. And that causes the Bauman capsule pressure to also increase. So this pressure basically is because stuff is coming out of this capillary and collecting here, very importantly, temporarily, okay? Because remember what is beyond this boundary here? It's the tubule. So it's, it's gonna stay here for a bit only. It's gonna, it's, it's continuously being drained. The fluid comes out and is drained into the uh, tubule, the renal tubule and so on. So the temporary rise of pressure here is around this value. However, whatever this value is, it does tend to oppose because it's a hydrostatic pressure. It would put some sort of resistance uh, to the outcoming of uh, the fluid out from the glomerular capillary. Okay, and hence there there is a high, uh, there is a equilibrium in these two pressures. Uh, as you remember, oncotic pressure or colloid osmotic pressure is exerted by plasma proteins, and and since they are colloidal in nature. They would like to keep uh, keep a hold on their on their fluid and not let it go. Hence, it's an anti-filtration uh, pressure, and its value is 32 mmHg. I.e., this is the pressure that the plasma proteins exert within the blood so that it doesn't the uh, the fluid doesn't go out. Okay. So, in the face of this pressure and this pressure, again, there is there is a balance here. Uh, which uh, keeps the formation of filtrate relatively constant. Now, uh, coming to the point, where is the oncotic pressure of Bauman capsule? Question mark, question mark. So basically, uh, we don't have it because if you remember, we have a double membrane structure here. Okay. And a double membrane structure means that we will not allow macromolecules to uh, come out beyond this uh, filtration barrier, okay? Hence, uh, it's uh, 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 very unlikely that any protein would come out uh, and roam around the Bauman capsule. Indeed, it's only uh, uh, certain diseases which break this uh, filtration barrier and then you have a free fall and in, uh, of all sorts of proteins coming into the Bauman capsule. And in that case, it becomes operational that you need to then also consider Bauman capsule or, or uh, oncotic pressure. But normally it should, it should be so, so less that it's negligible. We don't even mention it, okay? So when you calculate the net filtration pressure, which obviously is in favor of the hydrostatic pressure. So obviously looking at a cursory look at these numbers, would tell you that stuff needs to should be coming out mathematically. You just uh, use this equation. You you put in the uh, glomerular hydrostatic pressure. Uh, you subtract the Bauman uh, capsular pressure from it, and the main force. These two are anti-filtration. You just subtract them from the one pro-filtration force. You get a value of 10 mmHg, and this 10 mmHg, remember, is a uh, it, it looks like a small figure, but it's it's not. It is a continuous process. It's uh, it's the pressure at which continuously 180 liters of your plasma is uh, going through these glomeruli of both kidneys, and at a constant pressure of 10 mmHg, stuff is coming out. It's the sheer amount of blood that goes through this network that makes this apparently small amount of pressure, it actually has a huge consequence, if you know what I mean. So Starling forces is, is basically the generator of filtrate. Now, Starling forces in turn get affected by, very rashly speaking, the amount of blood that you make available to them. Look. Starling forces would not be there if blood doesn't arrive inside the glomerulus. The, the Starling forces are, uh, it, are, 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 are things which are in the blood. So blood exerts a hydrostatic pressure. That's a Starling force. 
blood has oncotic pressure that is again by virtue of blood being there so what makes the availability of blood in the glomerulus is two things the the rate of glomerular uh, blood flow i.e how much are you allowing the blood to come in and the second which basically if you really look at it closely is related to uh, rbf is the resistance so it's the it's the collective or individual resistance of afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole which will determine renal blood flow okay so, um, i.e what what amount of blood is coming into the glomerulus and this in turn will effect with an e starling forces so it's the resistance of the capillary network affecting renal blood flow which affect starling forces which are forming gfr okay it's in this sequence if you really want to uh, study it as a linked process so these are the three scenarios but before going into them let me just introduce you to this uh, to this learning method so what he shows is uh, an afferent arteriole glomerulus and then efferent arteriole the rest is very labeled very clearly now look at this to show you the resistance he just uh, uh, shows this uh, nice little analogy of a screwing mechanism uh, and if you tighten the screws uh, this constricts and hence the resistance increases so if you can imagine uh, you can have a have a, a mechanism which constricts uh, afferent arteriole you can have uh, you you have a, a mechanism by which you can constrict the efferent arteriole or both okay so now <clears throat> let's first look at what what happens if you increase the resistance of the afferent arteriole now if you see and it's very clear that whatever the feeding artery was when it formed the afferent arteriole uh, the the flow of blood to the afferent arteriole in this situation where you have increased the resistance of afferent arteriole the the blood coming to this side will decrease and hence the glomerular flow of blood will decrease in this uh, uh, in this example so increasing the resistance of afferent arteriole or in simple words vasoconstriction of afferent arteriole will decrease the rbf the renal blood flow which will decrease the gfr right what is the inter uh, uh, what is the uh, agent which agent of the stalling forces affects this uh, decrease in gfr the hydrostatic pressure naturally less blood less rpf in the glomerulus less capillary hydrostatic pressure which is the main filtration ag filtration agent and hence less the gfr okay this is very clear and simple this is this however is a bit more complex uh, uh, increase resistance of the efferent arteriole so in this example remember these are very important viva questions and mcqs are formed here on this based on this material so f in afferent you just vasoconstricted the afferent arteriole here you vasoconstrict the efferent arteriole now this has all sorts of consequences so um, don't be confused by this we will explain it in a bit so imagine that normal blood was passing through now i'm explaining this uh, scenario here okay uh, normal blood was passing through the afferent in the glomerulus and then blood was being drained out of the efferent arteriole 20 percent filtration fraction was being formed as we studied at the glomerulus and the 80 percent of blood was escaping through the efferent arteriole now what you do is you vasoconstrict the efferent arteriole mildly you see there is a co complexity here there are two sub scenarios in this scenario in this scenario one is mild constriction of the efferent arteriole and then there is a severe constriction of the efferent arteriole first let's work out the mild constriction now imagine if the efferent arteriole is mildly constricted what will happen to the blood flow the blood flow would decrease you have just increased the resistance of the escape vessel 
so obviously and you haven't done anything to the very importantly you haven't done anything to the afrin arterio it's it's uh, it's the same so if you in this whole system of blood coming here and through this and then escaping if you increase the resistance here what you are doing is you are trapping blood in the glomerulus and then you are also by trapping blood here in the glomerulus you are basically decreasing the fresh incoming blood right because there is damping of blood here in raising the hydrostatic pressure so the incoming blood the de the delta p would decrease and blood coming into the glomerulus will decrease eventually when effect of this efferent vasoconstriction takes place i hope this is clear under this increased uh, hydrostatic pressure gfr will increase i'll say it again in one sentence in va mildly vasoconstricting the efferent arteriole increases gfr by increasing the capillary hydrostatic pressure however overall the renal blood flow has decreased in this scenario okay very important this this can be asked in a in a tricky way uh, by the examiner he can ask you uh, give me a scenario where renal blood flow decreases however gfr increases now to the unprepared student this can be a uh, uh, a, a very off throwing question because uh, rationally speaking for gfr to increase you need to have increase in renal blood flow that's the straight equation right but in this particular efferent arteriole scenario which i told you is tricky uh, what happens is it does increase gfr increases but the overall blood flow through the whole system has actually decreased and you know now what's happening okay so you've done the mild vasoconstriction. What about severe vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole? What happens then? So it's not shown here, but if you really constrict it, seriously constrict it, almost occlude it, what will happen? What will happen is renal blood flow will, will further decrease. Yes. And the blood trapped here will have nowhere to go. Okay. When it has nowhere to go, it will become static here. There is stasis, no flow of blood will take place. Now the initial increase in the hydrostatic pressure, which resulted in increased GFR, obviously it will have a limit because there is no fresh blood flowing inside. Imagine that the blood trapped here is just trapped because, and now the efferent arteriole constriction is so severe that it cannot really move at all so the stuff that had to be uh, that could fill could be filtered out has actually filtered out during the mild efferent constriction phase that filtrate part has already become gfr what is left behind is less liquidy portion of the blood and more cellular portion of the blood so the hematocrit would increase won't you agree you have removed already the filtration fraction leaving behind the 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 blood is thicker quote unquote hematocrit is more so which pressure will increase in this situation which stalling force will increase if your answer is colloidal osmotic pressure will increase because plasma proteins will be concentrated per unit of blood then your answer is correct and then and because of increase of colloid osmotic pressure <clears throat> eventually the GFR will decrease. I'll say that in a sentence. So increasing efferent arteriolar constriction severely raises the plasma colloid osmotic pressure of the glomerular capillary blood, decreasing GFR in a scenario of decreased renal blood flow. Severe decreased renal blood flow. Okay. Now, final point is uh, saying it in one sentence. This is called the biphasic effect. D I P H A S I C. Biphasic, i.e., two phases. So, in efferent arterial vasoconstriction, mild efferent arterial constriction leads to increased GFR, while severe efferent arterial constriction leads to decrease in GFR. Okay. 
that's done. I hope you understood that. Uh, a final point here is this is not a this is not a theoretical exercise. Actually, what happens is a a a chemical called angiotensin two, and we'll talk about this in in this lecture later on. Angiotensin two is some is a, is is something that is formed in the blood, and since it's formed, obviously, while it's forming its amount in the blood is at first is low okay and it's a vasoconstrictor and it sort of likes the efferent arteriolar arteriole more than afferent arteriole so initially even at low plasma concentrations it has a vasoconstrictor effect on the efferent arteriole and as its amount in the blood raises further the amount of vasoconstriction the degree of vasoconstriction increases so at high levels of angiotensin 2, the efferent arteriole really chokes up, which we, met, we, which we mentioned that it is severe in vasoconstriction. So let me now say it in a sentence which mentions angiotensin 2. At low concentrations of angiotensin 2, brackets, uh, mild vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole, GFR is increased right while at higher angiotensin 2 in brackets severe vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole gfr is decreased okay hope that is that is clear this scenario you need to work out yourself we have actually dilated uh, the afferent arteriole while the rest is constant what will happen to the stalling force what will happen to the uh, gfr uh, and overall uh, under under uh, what value would uh, renal blood flow would be i would uh, look up the uh, comment section below uh, for students who work this out okay so having having dealt with stalling forces number two is filtration quotient filtration quotient very simply put is basically the overall status of your glomerular membrane uh, what is its permeability? So there are there are there are conditions, diseases in which this permeability decreases, and then there are other uh, uh, inflammatory uh, diseases being one of them, which may cause an increase in permeability of the glomerular membrane capillary. You can imagine if the permeability say increases, then the GFR would increase, right? Uh, uh, multiplied by uh, surface area. So there are. There are diseases in which there is loss of glomerular membrane so in in that in that uh, the surface area actually has decreased uh, so if you have a decrease in area of surface area across which the filtration is happening naturally the uh, the gfr would decrease this is a normal value of kf 12.5 look at the very interesting uh, unit here so it's milliliter per minute per unit pressure okay so it encapsulates both of these factors okay 